Good morning, good morning. We're gonna let the guests get in. I know it's a little earlier start today. So thank you for tuning in early with us. Shalanda, while we're waiting, I am uh, yeah. very excited about the Baltimore by Baltimore concert series. I know, I know. This is, this is really good. I was gonna talk a bit about it, um, but Waterfront, I think had a great idea and, and brought us and Visit Baltimore and its partners to support it. It's really good. So, and I liked your comments during the presser. Back so, at you. <laughs> with it. So I think we should probably, I know it's 8.32. We want to stick to the time as much as possible. I want to thank you all for joining us. Good morning and early morning to everyone uh, from the Downtown Download team. I am the president, Shalonda Stokes, joined as always by Baltimore Councilman Eric Costello, you know, our city is really lucky to have an amazing delegation in the Maryland General Assembly. And it's led by our guest this morning, Senate President Bill Ferguson. And he's just been a tremendous partner for all of his constituents in so many ways. So we'll get into a little bit of that, but I do wanna to talk to you about some things that are happening in downtown the same way we do. Councilman Costello, I'll transition it to you to give us a little bit of background on what's happening in the city. And then we'll come back and ask the tough questions. So a reminder to all of our attendees, please put your questions in the Q&A box. And after we get through our initial set, we wanna make sure that we get to your questions. Sound good? So with all of that, let me fill you in a little bit about what's happening at Downtown Partnership. If you have not already, please, please, please register to join us in person. So we're off of the virtual, but in person for our state of downtown. Baltimore Breakfast, that's May 9th at the Hyatt Regency. That's where we'll release our annual State of Downtown report featuring a distinguished panel from the Urban Land Institute. And that breakfast is sponsored by Gallagher, Avelius and Jones. And the report this year is sponsored by BGE. We wanna thank them both. They've been tremendous partners to us, but you do not wanna miss this event. So May 9th at the Hyatt Regency, all of this information you can get on our website. I also wanna make sure that you mark your calendars for the return of the Charles Street Promenade. Yes, the Charles Street Promenade, that's where we shut down uh, Charles Street. It is amazing for the vendors, shopping, just this pedestrian experience. So it's June 4th, it'll be from 9A to 9P. So we want dog walkers, bikers, roller skaters, just come out, enjoy the music, the walking tours, the sidewalk sales. And so we really hope to see you there on June 4th. And the one thing, and Councilman, I was coming back to the um, Baltimore by Baltimore. I know we did the launch of this last week. And what I want people to know, this is really exciting. A Waterfront Partnership came up with an initiative that not only celebrates the city, but we're also building the base. And so producers are hired to plan and curate an entire day of music, art, just all walks of life in there. And so we're excited downtown partnership and visit Baltimore to be partners in that work. So that takes place the first Saturday of the month from May through October. And so our first one will be May 7th. It is from noon to 8 p.m. Please, for more information on that, you can go to waterfrontpartnership.org. So Councilman, I think that's all I'm gonna say right now. Can you give us a little bit about what you have going on? Thanks so much, Shalanda. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about the Baltimore by Baltimore uh, concert series. Um, loved your comments the other day and, and really think it's just going to be an incredible catalyst to bring people together um, in the Inner Harbor. Um, you know, not only a place for, for our residents, but for employees downtown, um, as well as our visitors to, to really see the best of Baltimore. So a um, couple quick updates on the city side of things. Um, so there is a public meeting this evening uh, for the uh, for proposed changes to DOT's uh, Charm City Circulator System. Uh, that meeting is going to be virtual this evening from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, information on that's on my social media. I'll put a link in the chat window. In addition to that, the city is getting ready to kick off our budgeting process. Uh, that will include uh, Board of Estimates Taxpayers Night, which is going to be tomorrow evening. Uh, at 6 p.m. in the Board of Estimates room at City Hall. Uh, there will be a hybrid option for that. So that's an opportunity to come out and, and have your voice heard. Uh, in addition, uh, Baltimore City Council will do its own taxpayers night, uh, which we've been doing for about six years now. And that will be on Thursday, uh, May 26th at 6 p.m. in City Council Chambers. That will be live in person. 
And then we will kick off a week of budget hearings the day after uh, Memorial Day. So very much uh, looking forward to that. Um, Shalanda, as, as you know, uh, public safety is, is one of the uh, biggest challenges that we're facing uh, today. Uh, we have a meeting set up with Police Commissioner Harrison, uh, as well as other stakeholders uh, this afternoon to discuss deployments and strategies. I know that we'll be providing some updates uh, to our stakeholders uh, shortly after that meeting uh, with hopefully um, some more information on, on what you can look out for uh, this summer in terms of the city's efforts to ensure that uh, downtown is safe for residents, employees, and visitors. Uh, and finally, uh, you're gonna hear a little bit more about it from the Senate president today uh, with respect to uh, funding, uh, specifically capital funding. Uh, from the state for downtown and the Inner Harbor and infrastructure. Uh, there will be a press conference coming up in the very near future, so please keep an eye out for that uh, and, and learn more uh, about that exciting work. Uh, so with that, Shalanda, I'm going to turn it back over to you. All right, had to unmute so we didn't uh, have one of those full pods. So thank you for bringing it back to me. Thank you, Councilman. Um, it is now my distinct pleasure to welcome our guest, our friend, president of Maryland State Senate, Bill Ferguson. And just so that you know, he represents the downtown 46th district, along with House Speaker Adrian Jones and Governor Larry Hogan. They spearheaded a legislative session that in many ways feels like a love letter to Baltimore. Senate President Ferguson, Delegate Brooke Learman, Delegate Robin Lewis, Delegate Luke Clippinger of the 46th district. I, we thank you tremendously. We're excited to hear some of this stuff today. Also have to give Ross a shout out. I know he's been working with our team diligently. You guys have been amazing. So excited to talk about what's happening today. But outside of the session, we know that you've been incredibly responsive to your constituents. We appreciate your work with us and Governor Hogan in finding money to reaffirm the state's commitment to moving more than 3,000 jobs here in the Central Business District. So we thank you for that. And we know that you've been helping the business community in so many ways. So you're a strong advocate for helping close the digital divide, increasing social equity, and helping Marylanders recover financially from the COVID crisis. I don't have to tell this guest at all who you are, but I wanted you to hear it from us. And I speak on behalf of me, my board, my board chair, Mark Wasserman, when I say thank you tremendously for what you've done to downtown, but our entire city. So Councilman, I'm gonna transfer it back to you. Ask them the hard questions, save the easy ones for me. All right. <laughs> thank you, Shalanda. Uh, Senate President Ferguson, thank you so much uh, for being here with this morning and taking time out of your busy schedule. Really appreciate it. Of course, look, thank you, uh, Councilman. Thank you, Shalanda. Um, you know, and really thank you to the Downtown Partnership too, because I think, look, I'm so proud of the work that we were able to do. This was a historic year in many, many ways. I mean, it was a banner year for um, investment in Baltimore across the board, but definitely uh, for the downtown investment. And um, the reason that is able to happen is because the downtown partnership under your leadership, Shalanda, and, and the board's leadership has made it easy, right? Has made it easy to make the case that there is almost nothing more important than ensuring that our downtown core is vibrant and strong because as you and I and, and all of us know, um, there is not a single city in the entire globe where you have a struggling downtown and a thriving uptown. It does not exist. Uh, we are a symbiotic relationship when it comes to a city. And the downtown core is our commercial center. It is now our residential center as well. Um, it's our recreational center. It's a cultural hub. Um, it is what brings people to this region. And so you know, it is absolutely essential that if we want to be strong as a city, the downtown core must be thriving. Um, and look, it's been challenging uh, through COVID. Uh, you know, this has been historic, historic uh, hurdles to overcome. Um, but I am more, I am more optimistic today than I've ever been that as we emerge from this post COVID world, we have the opportunity to redefine what is Baltimore and what is our core need in order to be successful? And the good news is after this legislative session and, and, and part, partially last session, we're gonna have the resources to do it. Um, and we have the visionaries uh, with the Inner Harbor that are going to bring a brand new construct of, of what's possible. Um, we've already seen it with Rash Field and what's going on with the Waterfront Partnership uh, around the water. So I am very, very optimistic. Glad to get into all the details. I know I was just supposed to say hello, but um, 
sometimes, you know, I'm in the Senate. We don't have a, you know, we just keep going and going and going. <laughs> Senator, thank you. Shalanda, I, I'm pretty certain if we need a third co-host, we found our guy right here. Um, I also want to give a shout out to the Senate president and staff, um, Ross Eidman, who's fantastic. Uh, two 11th district constituents who work in the office, uh, Tyler McCurdy and, and Sally Robb, as well as Joy Walker. Um, he has a, a fantastic team down in there, Annapolis, supporting his work. Uh, Mr. President, my state senator, we're going to jump right into it. Um, as you mentioned, you've come off what some might consider an extremely unique legislative session. Uh, for the first time in many years, the state had a historic budget surplus that allowed the General Assembly and your colleagues to make some generational investments for our residents. Can you tell us a little bit about the approach the General Assembly took in determining the direction of these investments? Yeah, this was, I mean, truly a unique year, right? If you think back to January um, and how we were starting the session, you know, uh, I had the, the joys of experiencing COVID uh, with the, the whole Ferguson family back in December. I think everybody I knew um, and, and could talk to also was experiencing the, the, the challenges of COVID and Omicron. But that was the context that we were all coming into session with, was this brand new wave that we thought we were done and then it kicked back on and hospitals were in crisis. Uh, you know, we're, we're gonna do a remote session. Um, and, you know, I tried to hold out as long as possible to see if it would be possible to do in person fully without any restrictions. Uh, but when the new year came around, I think it was January 5th or so, and, and the governor imposed the new state of emergency, you know, it was pretty obvious this was going to be a tough, uh, a, a tough year again. And, you know, the last thing in the world was I wanted to, to have a session like last year's, uh, like the 2021, which was the most challenging emotionally, policy-wise. It was just a very, very hard year. Uh, but when we started, we said, all right, we're going to make, we're going to target Valentine's Day by February 14th. We think this, this Omicron is going to burn hot and we're gonna get ourselves back in person. It was a very, very, very tough call, um, but it was probably one of the better decisions I made throughout the session was to bring people back. Why? This was a historic year and we had a surplus that is, you know, in the 12 years I've been in office, this is the first time I've walked into a session with a surplus. Um, it's a very different type of year, but we also walked in with a lot of angst and uncertainty and people were scared about the world. You know, it was unclear, you know, uh, yes, we've been done with virtual learning to a degree, but whether we were coming back in person or not was, was an open question in the winter holidays. There was kind of this sense that, the, that you know, the, our economy was doing remarkably well, but it, it just felt very untenable. And so there were two things that mattered most. It was the health and well-being of, our, of, of Marylanders' health and our economy. That is what mattered. We had to focus on the basics. We had to make sure that we were making investments in the, state, uh, the state's economic future, the prospects in a post-COVID world, and we had to make sure that our healthcare system and the health of Marylanders uh, was as strong as possible. And so that drove every single decision that we made uh, in the General Assembly. And I, you know, I'm, I'm somebody that really believes in the power of a unified vision. Um, that was the focus. It was health and the economy were our, were our lens by which we approached everything. And now, of course, those are big buckets, right? Economic opportunity is not a singular thing. It is a diverse series of interests that have to be maintained and protected. Similarly with health, it's not just physical health. While of course COVID made that an obvious challenge, it's all of it. It's, it's, our, it's our safety, it's our belief in our, our well-being, that we can prosper, that we can raise a family. Um, but also importantly, it's, it's our mental health. It is how we approach one another and who we are and the challenges that we've all faced over these last two years. Um, and so it was sort of from that perspective that we took on a lot of major issues and I think landed in a place that Marylanders should feel really proud. I mean, it was tense at times, but at the end of the day, we worked across the aisle, across chambers with bipartisan solutions to really solve big problems and move forward a, a, a capital budget that is truly, truly historic, uh, along with the operating budget that is going to be setting us up for, for success down the line here. So um, it was a great year and it was because of that sort of um, condensed focus around, you know, the things that mattered most uh, that I think that we were so successful. Thank you. And, and really looking forward to hearing um, some of the specifics uh, in terms of numbers of what you did. Uh, the, the combination of the pandemic crisis, um, the rise in inflation, uh, that's really placed a strain on our residents and on the economic sector. Can you tell us a little bit about the targeted tax relief package that was passed this session? Yeah, and I, I would say the tax relief package was one of the, the kind of the crux of the larger deal. If we could come to agreement with the governor, 
um, on sort of what the tax relief package would look like, it would unlock the opportunity for all the other investments. Um, as everyone knows that in, in Maryland until next year, um, after this ballot initiative, or excuse me, the constitutional uh, amendment that will be on the ballot this, uh, or was on the ballot this last term, uh, last cycle will be now in effect after this next election. Uh, the governor has a lot of budgeting authority in the state of Maryland. That will shift and the power will, will balance a little bit. Uh, but we needed to, to come to agreement with the governor. And, and I will tell you, it was not easy at times because um, you know, the Senate is a place where we solve problems. Uh, the House is uh, a place where there are you know, really strong opinions and, and more members, uh, often at more at odds with the administration. And so the Senate was really in a unique position to be able to broker a deal and bring parties together and solve the kind of bigger questions of how we could move things forward. And so, you know, there were a number of days where it was a bit, a bit uncertain that we would get to a deal, um, but uh, we got there, we got there and that's what matters. So what does it include? Um, so overall, uh, it's about a $2 billion uh, economic relief package for Maryland's working families, retirees and small businesses. Um, the one that really was the headline was those who've been impacted the most by COVID and inflation. It's those on a fixed income, our retirees individuals over the age of 65 who have helped to build the state of Maryland and uh, you know we know have have struggled the most in the midst of COVID and are now kind of feeling it from the other end with rising prices. Not that anybody is, is immune from the rising prices, but we know that our seniors on fixed incomes have, have really uh, have had the, the biggest hit. And so uh, the package that we included has a thousand um, dollar tax credit and 1750 for individuals who make over $100,000 in retirement income, or if you're married, over $150,000 in retirement income. You couple that with the exclusions we have for pension income and social security. And so this is, it will be a major, major, major relief uh, for seniors living in the state of Maryland. Um, it also is tied to our, our hometown heroes, our first responders and military veterans uh, who are able to, to participate in this, um, in this tax relief as well. Uh, you know, if I've learned anything, it's that uh, the people that are running towards the building, uh, that are running towards the problem, uh, that are running towards the gunshot, uh, you know, we really need to do what we can to make sure that they're supported and they feel uh, that they can, uh, you know, that they can live and participate in Maryland as well and as better as, as anybody here. Um, and so uh, this tax relief package included those uh, hometown heroes uh, as well. Uh, we have about $195 million to fund the work opportunity tax credit. These are for employers who hire hard, generally underserved or, or long-term unemployed individuals, returning citizens, individuals who have been on unemployment for six months or more. Uh, and so this is a federal program that, pre, that, that already existed. And we used a $195 million of additional state dollars to, to add on, to be sort of the subsidy plus the bonus points, bonus dollars for those who hire individuals uh, who can benefit from that employment. Um, we also, of course, did the 30-day gas tax pause on um, in recognition of kind of the, the impacts of what happened with U uh, Ukraine and, and the Russian aggression that's really kind of driving oil, uh, oil prices upwards. Um, you know, this was something that we knew was not going to be a permanent solution, but at the time wanted to give space for more global uh, uh, problem solving to happen. And I think largely got there. If you look actually at the price of the pump, um, with the 36 cent drop that we had for those 30 days, the price has only gone up one or two cents uh, overall, and, I, and that was sort of what we were hoping, that we could give some time and, and prevent Marylanders from dealing with the, with the shock of, of what was happening um, and the impacts on the global marketplace. And then finally, we had uh, about $115 million for what we're calling kind of the family budget boosters. These are working families, uh, and we remove the sales tax on things like diapers and car seats and baby bottles and health products that families have to buy. They're necessities. They don't have a choice uh, whether or not to buy diapers. Uh, and so, you know, we wanted to make sure that, that all members of our, of our community were, were experiencing in the, the benefits of this tax relief package. It was targeted. It was purposeful. It was not, it's not going to set us up for a fiscal cliff a few years down the line. Um, and we really got to a great place. I feel really proud of, of, the, uh, of, of the place that we landed. Um, I do just want to add a small couple, two small little things that I think are important for the city. Um, we were able to nearly double the historic tax credit. Uh, this is probably one of the most productive tax credits in the state of Maryland, and the city of Baltimore benefits from it enormously. Downtown uh, has utilized the historic tax credit to see some of the revitalization that we have happened, or that has happened. And so we were able to double that amount. It was always oversubscribed, stuck at 11 million a year. It's going up to 20 million. 
And uh, you know, it's one that I think is really gonna be important for, for the city moving forward. Um, final thing is that we exempted all businesses from personal property tax if the personal property tax was less than 20,000. And so these are all these small businesses that are out there. Your LLCs, your uh, sole proprietorships, those that, that are you know, building, building our economy, but you know, are kind of stuck in administrative filings and uh, you know, just the reporting of $20,000 of personal income, there's an impact for a small business. And so we were able to exclude uh, those costs for businesses moving forward. Um, you know, lots of lots of pieces to this, but uh, you know, overall, the headline is uh, this was the largest tax relief package we've ever done in in the state of Maryland, and uh, it was done responsibly, it was done purposefully, uh, and it's setting us up for a fiscally uh, brighter future moving forward. That's great to hear, um, and it does sound like you know the Senate was very and the the House was very intentional uh, about how to target that. I want to shift over to uh, public safety for a minute. Um, as you know, Mr. President, public safety is top of mind in every major American city right now, and Baltimore City is certainly no exception. Um, in the funding uh, that was approved this, this past session, uh, there is $1.5 million in operating support uh, to help fund public safety efforts downtown. Can you take a couple minutes to help us understand the comprehensive safety package that was advanced this past session. Yeah, listen, you know, Sean and and, uh, and Eric, this is uh, it's a place where I think we all share a level of frustration, right? Um, the level of violence that we've seen in the city of Baltimore for the last few years, but particularly in the last, you know, the last year, last uh, 14 months, it's just untenable. It's not acceptable. It cannot continue. Um, we have got to stop normalizing the level of violence that has existed. And it's not just the, the murders and first degree assaults and, and, and most serious cases. It, it's all of it. It's the violence on the street. It's the cell phone snatching. It's, it, it, it cannot continue. We cannot be in a place that people don't feel safe, where we believe that there is going to be a, uh, well, investments moving forward, where people feel like they live in a neighborhood where they can walk their kids down the street. That doesn't work if people don't feel safe. Um, and so, you know, we, we also know, so pause, that is an important point. We also know that there's not a piece of legislation that's gonna solve this problem. Um, we in the legislative branch are absolutely responsible for providing the resources, the policy framework for ensuring that the tools are available. But at the end of the day, no matter the level of government, the thing that will make the difference to reduce violence is a coordinated plan of all levels of executive agencies that are working every single day on a unified vision. That means all parts of the criminal justice system. It means the local, state, and federal government agencies that are charged with uh, 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 upholding the criminal justice system overall. And it can't just be about arrests. We know the costs of that. It's four parts. Uh, it is first about prevention. It's doing whatever it takes uh, to prevent crime from happening in the first place. It's about intervention so that before things get serious, we intervene and we slow things down. Uh, it is about justice, that if somebody breaks the law, there are swift and certain consequences, and that there is actual uh, 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 prosecution and consequences for breaking the law and creating havoc. And then finally, it's about rehabilitation, because after that justice has been served and somebody's coming back into our community, we need to make sure that they have the resources and tools that they, they need in order to not reoffend in the future. So if, if any four of those components of the, of the crime fight is not dealt with, then we're losing. And I think the challenge that we have at the moment is that in each of those four pillars, we do not have a unified and clear plan and strategy about how to move forward. And so I am very proud of what we were able to, the additional resources and the frameworks that we were able to, to provide this session when it comes to the crime fight here across the state. Um, I do worry that we do not yet have a unified plan, a unified vision for how we create safe communities here in the city of Baltimore, but also the entire state. And it's, it, there has to be a better level of coordination and focus on each of these different pillars. Um, I will just say very briefly, some of the, the additional things that we were able to do, we put significant money into warrant apprehension efforts. Uh, this is something where we know that there are an unbelievable number of outstanding warrants uh, of both violent crimes and nonviolent. And we need to prioritize it on the violent crimes of those, those outstanding warrants and apprehend those so that they can be held uh, held to account and that we can rehabilitate them uh, after you know they've served their time for, for breaking the law. Um, we've established a brand new uh, 
uh, gun center here in the state of Maryland that's going to be run with the Maryland State Police. Uh, what we've seen is that crime guns are too often not tracked. And so, you know, we're seeing prosecutors lose cases because they don't have the appropriate information or there's not a good chain of custody. And so the Maryland Crime Center will be run out of the, the governor's office of crime prevention uh, and will be a statewide database because we know a lot of the guns, they aren't purchased here in the city. They're often purchased in the region or out of state. And we need to be able to track those and link them to crimes uh, as unfortunately they, that we've experienced over the last two years. Um, we've also banned ghost guns. Um, this has been something that the city struggled with. Uh, we've seen a 700% increase in the number of, of ghost guns used in crimes. Uh, and unfortunately, our framework in Maryland, didn't, these were not illegal. They weren't illegal to, to either put together or to possess. And so now we have a new, uh, a new tool for prosecutors to utilize uh, with um, crime guns. We passed a new judicial and prosecutorial transparency bill. Uh, the, um, the, the criminal justice system is very opaque. It's hard to understand what's happening within it. It's very complex. This will hopefully kind of bring some light uh, into what's working and what's not working. Uh, and then finally, we increase notification between the entities that, that deal with, uh, with, the, with the crime fight. So our public safety, our jails, our prisons, uh, our, the police department, um, we are making sure that there's notification provided so that community members and police officers know that if somebody is released pending trial, uh, that there can be eyes to make sure that either they have the services they need to, to not reoffend before trial or that there's somebody watching to make sure that they don't do anything crazy between uh, coming home and, and, and them standing trial. And so, um, you know, that's all of these tools, I think, are really important measures. None of it will matter if executive agencies at the state and local and federal levels are not organized and coordinated on an everyday crime plan fight. Um, and so uh, I'm hopeful we'll get there. Uh, but I, what I do know is the urgency is needed now more than ever. Thank you, Senator. I want to shift over to the capital budget and specifically specifically the work that you and our delegates in the 46th district delegate Luke Clippinger, uh, Brooke Learman and Robin Lewis did this past session. Uh, the General Assembly passed the capital budget, which significantly uh, increased investments in capital projects, uh, not only in downtown Baltimore, but all throughout the 46th district. Uh, and the list is incredibly impressive, to say the least. Can you tell us a little bit about some of your highlights in terms of the capital investments in and around downtown? Yeah, I mean, look, when you have a surplus, especially money that's a surplus that's um, uh, not necessarily ongoing dollars, that's uh, more of a one-time, like we've seen with the federal dollars, in influx uh, has allowed us to make one-time investments. There's nothing better than capital investment. It puts people to work. It invests in our infrastructure. Uh, you know, it, it beautifies areas. So um, we, we really did heavy lifting when it came to the capital budget this year. Um, and I'm really proud to report this year in the 46th district, we're going to be bringing home just about $49 million in various products, uh, uh, in various projects uh, across the entire district. But certainly downtown was one of the largest beneficiaries of that. Um, so first and foremost, we have $10 million that's coming to the downtown partnership uh, that will be used for beautification, safety initiatives, lighting, greenery, doing these critical investments. Uh, that, that really the, improve the public spaces to make downtown a, a beautiful and thriving place. Um, and that's 10 million this year, followed by 10 million next year and 10 million the following year. So ultimately, this is a $30 million investment in the infrastructure of downtown to really help uh, build the public side that encourages and in, incentivizes uh, uh, private investments. Uh, we also got $7.5 million for the Inner Harbor Promenade. Um, look, there's, this is an incredibly exciting opportunity. It's going to be complex. I'm sure it will be, you know, controversial at times in some ways, but uh, that's the only way you know you're making real change. This is one of those projects that's going to be a game changer. Um, and, you know, we saw it happen for the city in the 70s uh, as we rebuilt the Inner Harbor. Uh, this is now round two, and we get to invest for Baltimore residents and create spaces that are for them, that tourists from all across the globe will enjoy but that will be for Baltimoreans first and foremost. Um, we've, we have another four and a half million dollars going into the Reginald F. Lewis Museum. This is such an incredible space uh, that while not exactly in the core, certainly is uh, right on President Street there and I think is an asset that, that uh, people across the state have been able to enjoy. Uh, we have $3 million going to the uh, National Aquarium, $3 million for the next phase of Rash Field. 
uh, two and a half million dollars for the Maryland Science Center downtown to make sure that they can make the improvements that they need uh, to, to continue to be successful. We have another $2 million going into the Warner Street Entertainment District. This is the area between the casino and the stadiums. Uh, when the casino went down there, the goal was to create this entertainment corridor. Um, it started, it had fits and starts. We, we have Top Golf kind of finally moving, uh, and actually not finally, there's really remarkable progress happening, but that corridor has really struggled to take off and become an entertainment district like we had hoped. Um, we are on the precipice, and this $2 million was crucial to do the streetscaping and the public investments uh, to, to ensure that we could really create that entertainment, uh, that entertainment hub. And then a few of the smaller ones that are out there, um, but you know, they're still very, very substantial. $300,000 for the Pride of Baltimore, uh, $200,000 for the Chesapeake Shakespeare Company, which anybody that's listening, if you have not gone to see a show at the Chesapeake Shakespeare Company, what is wrong with you? Uh, buy a ticket, go see six of them. It is an incredible facility. Uh, and then finally, $200,000 for the Ship Calkers House Restoration, uh, which is a cool place, a, a really, really cool space um, that, uh, you know, really they're, they're trying to renovate and, and get reopened post-COVID. Uh, it's an amazing place, and uh, uh, we were able to put some dollars in to close a gap. So it's a lot of money, um, and I'm really proud of it. It's really, it's going to be phenomenal work, and, and that's coupled with the investments we're making in parks uh, across the state, but, but certainly here in the city. So um, we did good work. It sounds like it. And, um, you know, we have some of the best assets in the state of Maryland in downtown Baltimore. Um, so I, I think that's going to go a long way. I uh, just want to remind everyone, uh, if you have questions uh, for Senator Ferguson, please put those in the Q&A box. I know Shalanda received a number of questions in advance. Um, Bill, I want to jump back to the, the $10 million uh, for downtown Baltimore. And that's a, a three-year commitment. And as I mentioned earlier, there's going to be a press conference coming up in the uh, immediate to near future to dive into that a little bit more, as well as uh, Inner Harbor Promenade and some of those capital investments. Can you drill? I, I think it's worth talking about a little bit more in detail. Right, Shalanda? I, I think just in terms of that investment, uh, in terms of open space in downtown, can you drill a little bit more down into that $10 million and in, in what you envision there? Yeah, and, and, let, and that's me, over a three-year period, ten million per year. Exactly, and um, you know this is what at the very beginning, at the top of this, when I when I was sort of thanking Chalanda, the board, and Downtown Partnership as an organization. You know, this this investment was able to happen because the Downtown Partnership thought creatively, thought differently, and said, "Look, this is the moment. Like, if this if there were a time that we could use public dollars on public assets to create and stimulate private investment, now is now is that time." Uh, and so, you know, through uh, conversations with, I think, and Shalandi, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, really visionaries from across the country about the downtown and what are the, the key investments to really, to make in the public, uh, the public spaces to be able to create a thriving environment. That was the basis of this plan. Um, and, you know, what we now have the opportunity to do is, is do the things. It, and it's simple stuff, right? I mean, that's how it always is. It's the simple stuff matters the most. It's lighting, it's greenery, it's open venues, it's having, uh, you know, sidewalks and entertainment and programming. And, you know, we're, it's, it's, the, it's the basics that really will matter. Um, and so, you know, what I think is very exciting is that the, the, the work that's already been done to plan out some of these investments now can be unlocked. It's not just a plan on a piece of paper. It's it's a it's an actionable uh, template for investing in public spaces. And I don't know, Sean, if there's anything I missed that you wanted to jump in on there. No, no, thank you for that. I think the only thing I'll I'll talk about, and we will explain a little bit more. It ties into what we're doing at the state of downtown. But we brought in um, the Urban Land Institute and in that expert panel to do exactly what you said, Senate President. It was really taking a of a look at the city and look at ways how we could build on the assets, ways that we could invest in public infrastructure and just, you know, thank you for that. I want to also shout out Margrave, who was very helpful in that process as well. Agreed. Well said. And, I, you know, I'd say we started this, the, the initial trend of this, you know, thinking about what was going to happen at State Center and, you know, as State Center gets reimagined, uh, the state agencies that are there have to locate somewhere. Um, this was another agreement in the 21 session between, you know, largely the governor and, and the General Assembly. Um, it just makes sense to invest in, in areas where there can be kind of uh, the state dollars can go towards further enhancing private investment. And so 
you know, we, we started last year and, and as the Department of Health and a number of other agencies start to, to locate in their new places, which is going to take more time than just the nature of, of relocations, but I wish they were already there, uh, but to help re, uh, re-energize downtown and reinvest, uh, once people see that energy and see the, 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 the foot traffic, the reopening of the cafes, the dry cleaners, the the corner stores that have business again and that there's energy, you know, it's just like anything with real estate. Um, momentum matters. And so what, what these dollars I think will really help to do is, is foster that momentum. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, we, we talked a little bit about the Inner Harbor as well and the significant investment there. Um, this sentiment of doubling down on downtown Baltimore, I know it's one that this group lives by all the time really. Uh, as does just about everyone in our audience uh, today. Uh, Ballard Spar, Wells Fargo, Design Collective, Truist, and other highly respected institu- institutions um, are choosing to relocate or stay in the heart of downtown Baltimore. Uh, and the Inner Harbor matters so much to the Central Business District, as you know, Mr. President, and it trickles out to all the downtown neighborhoods and the surrounding neighborhoods. What is the state's investment in the Inner Harbor Promenade? I know you talked about it a little bit at a high level. And what value uh, do you see that that bringing to helping to turn around the Inner Harbor? Yeah, look, I think at the end of the day, um, what's most critical is a clear vision here. Um, and we need, we need to have a, a, an imaginative, an exciting, and a doable plan. Um, all of that was not possible as the as Harbor Place was sort of being locked up in bankruptcy court, or I, don't, I guess it wasn't, I don't even know the full exact logistics of, of, of what it, uh, why it was sort of stuck in stalemate. Um, and what we needed was somebody to come in with a big idea and, and find a way to move this project. Uh, and I think we're, we're really, we're there. We are, we, are on the, we are at the place where now this vision making can happen. Um, so that was an absolutely necessary, but insufficient. Um, we also have to deal with the realities of the infrastructure. So this project was done, you know, 40, 50 years ago, uh, the, da- the investment in, down- in the Inner Harbor. Um, and so the seven and a half million dollars that we are putting forward for the Inner Harbor this year is largely for the promenade, because frankly, it doesn't matter if it falls in the water. Uh, and this has been years and years and years uh, where the water has eroded kind of the basic infrastructure underneath. Uh, we also know that climate change is a very real thing uh, and that we have seen increased flooding over the last 15 years downtown in the Inner Harbor uh, more than ever each year. We're breaking a new record. And so, you know, we have to make sure that we are thinking about resiliency and how we are building our infrastructure to be able to protect against what we know is already existing climate change. And so um, if we are going to come, if we're going to have a, a brand new investment, a, a brand new space for all of Baltimoreans in the Inner Harbor, uh, we got to set up that public infrastructure in a way that sustains it for the long haul. And so this will not be enough. The seven and a half million dollars is not going to be enough to do the whole thing. It does allow us to get started on the planning, the design, the engineering of really getting a full assessment of what it will take to really rethink and reimagine that promenade across the water. Um, So that as these additional investments come at Harbor Place and and in the surrounding areas, we really have the, 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 we have the the build sites that are able to, to withhold whatever we dream up. Um, And so uh, this is the the first investment of what will be more, uh, but it's incredibly, incredibly important. I do want to say it's also partnered with, I think, you know, this was uh, a bit undercovered, uh, which is okay. Uh, but we also made sure that the stadiums uh, in the city of Baltimore have the necessary resources to be able to be to experience their next phase two. Uh, the Inner Harbor and Camden Yards were sort of these symbiotic builds. Uh, they happened together. They're both old. They both need reinvestment. And so um, we were also able to authorize uh, you know, 600, $600 million for Camden Yards and $600 million for Raven Stadium to ensure that those two spaces continue to be regional gems that people want to come to and flock to, hopefully on a year-round basis, and then enjoy the Inner Harbor and all of the shops and restaurants and museums and cultural centers that we have. So um, this is the lifeblood of the city of Baltimore. Uh, it is the heart, it is the beating heart that, that brings people here, that gets them to see the joy of coming together. Uh, and we got to invest. And so uh, you know that's what we did this year. And, and I feel really great about where we're headed. Senate President, 
uh, Ferguson, uh, you referred to fans coming to um, Camden Yards and M&T Stadium and you used the verb flock to. Very outstanding. Uh, well played. Uh, Shalanda, I'm going to kick it over to you. I know we've got a number of uh, great questions from our audience. We, we do, we do. Before we get into those, uh, Senate President, I also want to, and, and to the audience overall, just thank you all for the tremendous support that you gave me and to the Downtown Partnership Organization during the time of you know, my loss. And when I look at the great work that you guys are doing, especially around scaling up the warrant apprehension efforts, it means a lot. Um, for everybody on here, I know, and, I, and I, I continue to get cards. I thank you because it sustains me throughout this process. But, but part of what we know is the person who murdered my brother had two open warrants, right? And so at a certain point, really being able to come in and, and see the legislature kind of come in and, and figure out how we put process and policy behind doing that means a lot. And so personally, thank you. And thank you to all for your continued efforts. Um, do want to stay on the area of safety for a minute. We have between Sue and Jim, I think, a, a question and a compliment at the same time. I mean, we know that there have been some things happening. Um, downtown is the fastest growing neighborhood in the city. You know, and so there's a question around what can be done about some of the quality of life crimes. And in it, Sue references the rooftop party um, that had about 300 people on it, you know, not suitable, you know, questions around BPD's response to that. But in the midst of all of that, you both got a shout out for your quick response um, with updates and all of that. So really a twofer, we're trying to figure it out, but we know there's a, a broader issue. Yeah, look, I, um, and uh, yeah. I'm one of the issues that I know got a lot of attention uh, and kind of maybe more attention than we sort of thought because it was a spe specific challenge that we were going after and not necessarily a broader strategy for citywide crime, but obviously, um, you know, the, the properties at the block and sort of the issues that we'd seen on, on Baltimore Street and the impact of the spillover uh, that we had seen. Um, and, you know, that was a hard conversation uh, in many, many ways. But what I know is that we landed in a good spot where, where everyone is a part of the conversation, including downtown partnership, who will help and have additional resources to be able to ensure that in those late night events that we have the resources that are necessary uh, so that we have uh, appropriate law enforcement coverage. Uh, but law enforcement isn't going to be the only answer here. We, need, we needed owners to be part of the, of the solution too. And so ultimately that's where we landed, where all of the establishments uh, in the block area are going to be a part of a, a security plan and have ongoing communication between all parties so that when problems look like they may be emerging or something happens where it's in, 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 uh, you know, there's word of a big challenge, we actually will have a, a, a means of bringing people to account and also to the table to make sure that it doesn't happen uh, moving forward. And so, um, you know, I think those are the types of different solutions we need in order to, to move forward. Um, I did see a little, I, I did see something in there around kind of the BPD staffing issue. Yeah. Um, and I will tell you, you know, I know Councilman Costello can, can answer this as well. Um, from my my vantage point at the state, well, of course, you know, the city is, is, is my um, pride and joy, uh, this is not a unique problem for BPD. Um, this is every single law enforcement agency across the state of Maryland, the state level or local, uh, is facing very, very unique and um, specific recruitment and retention challenges. And I think there's a lot of reasons why. It's, um, you know, I think law enforcement overall is going through an evolution. Uh, this happens in industries all the time. Uh, and sort of the nature of policing is changing across the country. Uh, and effective policing is being redefined and reconstituted and re retrained. Uh, and so, you know, this is, this is not unique to Baltimore, but it is a problem in Baltimore. And we do have a, a shortage of, of individuals and officers based on the deployment that I think we would, we would most like to see. Uh, we do have remarkable men and women out there every day on the streets doing double shifts, trying to do the best that they can uh, with the resources that they have. Uh, we, of course, need to hire more. We, of course, need to recruit more. But most importantly, we need to retain the officers that we have. Uh, that is a crucial, crucial component. We cannot let uh, retirements outpace new hires uh, because, you know, we can say today we want 300 new officers. It takes roughly 14 to 18 months for that to be reality. And so what's most important is you invest in who you have today. You make sure they have the training, that they have the resources, that they have the support, that they know that they go out there every day. 
uh, and do the, the work to constitutionally police and create a safer city. Uh, and so that is an absolutely, absolutely uh, critical component to this. Um, in the meantime, we, we need to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. So we've got to bring on more, but we've got to make sure that we're retaining who we've got. Absolutely. Thank you. And I, I see, I know we moved the, the question from Bruce to the answer column, but there were a couple other things that I'd like to elaborate on in that area. So Bruce Pansner, uh, one of our board members who also created um, the Post 114 Coalition, particularly focused on the Lexington Market area and, and, and a lot of investment that's happening in that area between Lexington Market, the Superblock, it's all of these, the arena, all of that that's really bringing it up. Um, I do want to highlight for this group, and it's it's in its infant stage, um, but I see Dr. Gerald is on. Um, Dr. Gerald, Dr. Santa, and I are really looking to also convene, you know, the west side that crosses MLK, you know, beyond this talk about the west side of downtown into the west side of the city, because we know that that crime is happening in those areas and there's going to take a collective response, city, state, downtown partnership, businesses, partners, and all of this part. Um, what are your thoughts in, because it's really a, a particular concern around the safety in the Lexington market area, do you have any additional thoughts, insights for that in particular? I mean, look, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, okay, right, that we can share uh, publicly right now. Uh, no. Look, I think that we're struck, um, I think it was a mistake to make a policy of non-arrest for nonviolent offenses. I think uh, that the, the issue that we have in the city around um, kind of the lack of clarity of what happens when somebody breaks the law uh, has, has created a real problem. That does not mean the answer is just through arrest, right. but it does mean that the, when there is a lack of clarity, I'm all for prevention, I am all for intervention, but that only works if you have the systems in place to prevent and to intervene. And I think the challenge that we have here in the city is that all of a sudden overnight, we had a brand new policy we didn't have diversion systems set up. We didn't have uh, uh, you know, restorative intervention in place. And so we just sort of made a brand new policy and then didn't have in place all of the important things that actually divert the, the activity from happening. And so I think that was a fundamental failure. Uh, I think that it was done without full, uh, full appreciation for the impacts. And um, as a result, I think it's created a great deal of confusion. And it's not just in downtown, it's not just in Lexington Market. I think it is, uh, I think you're seeing across the board, community members feel very, very frustrated that they don't know what to do. And they wanna know what, where are we supposed to go? Um, and so I totally believe in prevention. I totally believe in intervention. I think we should be urgently setting up those systems to divert because we know that an arrest does not necessarily solve the underlying issue. But that doesn't mean that the underlying issue isn't a problem. And so um, we've got to be able to, to have clear systems. If we have rules in place, um, if we don't like them, if we think that they shouldn't be criminal activity or that they shouldn't, there shouldn't be criminal penalty attached, we should change the law. We should pass a bill that changes the law. That's how we should approach change in our society. Not, we, we should not be in a place where we're creating confusion because things are on the book, but we're kind of, we're, we don't know what to do with them. And so, um, I think that that is a challenge that we have seen um, in, in the Lexington market area uh, that has been, been some, somewhat significant. I will also say, so in the prevention and intervention side, one of the big challenges that I think we're gonna be dealing with with the long tail of COVID um, is the, the mental and behavioral health impacts that the last two years have, has had. Um, and we have made this year historic investments in new mental health and behavioral health uh, approaches access to counseling and treatment uh, that will be significant, significant expansion in the availability for people to get the services that they need to, to um, uh, you know, hopefully be supported and feel whole. Um, you know, I, this is not the answer to Lexington Market, but it, it certainly is something that comes to mind because um, you know, this past year, we had the highest number of overdose deaths in the city and across the state that we have ever seen in the history of, of Maryland. Um, that to me is a sign that, that people are not well. And so we have got to find ways to get them well um, and, and make sure that they have access to the services that they, they need to be able to, to you know, um, uh, make different choices. And um, so we are, we are certainly making the investments to make that possible. But I do think we need to have some more clarity when it comes to, to how we approach 
uh, sort of street level issues uh, that uh, that really they create an environment of disorder. Right. No, absolutely. Part of what you are talking about, it, we got a, a pre question that really talked about how we're structured. And it makes me think when you started to talk, the question was, why is it so difficult for Baltimore to have the same independence and be treated the same as other Maryland cities, as any other Maryland city? Because we're different, I think. You know, at the end of the day, I, you know, I, I, um, you, you look across the board, our, our, our Baltimore City Community College is a state entity. Uh, our, our city jail is run by the Department of Corrections in the state. Um, our school system is funded 83, 84% of the funds that go in the $1.6 billion school budget are from the state. Uh, the, um, the, the vast majority of our transportation funding comes from the state. Uh, the convention center, the stadiums are state assets with run by the stadium authority. The convention center is a joint partnership between the city and the state. So we have a shared destiny because as the way Baltimore goes is the way that the state goes. And, and that can frustrate people that are not from Baltimore, but that's the fact. And so if we, um, if we wanna have a strong state, if we wanna have an economic engine, if we wanna build a stronger future and build a middle class, Baltimore must be well and thriving. And so um, these, at times, these last eight years have been challenging because uh, you know, it takes a lot of coordination between city and state agencies. When there's tension between those two, brand, two levels of government, the people of Baltimore suffer. And so, you know, I really fundamentally see that as part of my job first as, as a state senator for the 46th district, but also as the presiding officer of the Senate of Maryland to help facilitate those conversations and bring people to the table to say, look, we gotta get the egos and put them aside. Right. This is the time where we gotta solve problems. Um, and I think we're, we're, we're there. Of course, we have a very big election coming up uh, in, uh, in November. And you know, it's really important that whoever, whomever the next governor is understands the intricacies of that city state relationship because it is very unique and it is very important. And it's something that has to be maintained with the appropriate level of balance and thoughtfulness. Um, hopefully I'm still around to be able to help facilitate it as well, but you know, the executives really, really matter. And so we've got to make sure that we've got uh, a, a good team on board that's ready to kind of to really maximize the potential that I know that I know our downtown has. Right. No, which is great. I think part of what we know is, and you said it earlier, collaboration is key. And as long as we're all putting our efforts in the same direction, you know, we'll get the outcome that we're looking for. I know even for us here, it's been great partnering with our downtown partnership, our guides, our security efforts, working with the Maryland State Police officers, the Baltimore City School Police, the UMB Police, the MTA. I mean, part of it is when we are in sync, I think great things happen. So thank you for that. Shifting to a little bit somewhat funny, but, but you know, not in the thought. Our friend Charlie Duff is really trying to figure out how we feed the ecosystem. And so it's a question around, you know, once we have all of these state employees down here, we need to make sure that they're going into the restaurants. And so his question was, you know, can they get a longer lunch than an hour so that they can support the cafes and restaurants? Well, look, I, I you know, that, thank you, Charlie. And I love that sort of creative thinking about like, how do we stimulate things without just a, you know, thinking out of the box? That's the first I've heard of this. So I got to look into this. I, I, my answer is I don't know, um, uh, but really, you know, a, a thoughtful issue that we got to figure out. Oh, he out. said they uh, only have a half hour. I half hour they needed it. Yep. I think that's what I was wondering. Yeah, so they probably uh, you know that's an issue. Um, you know, I, I imagine like the Uber Eats of the world and stuff, the delivery world will, will certainly benefit from having more folks uh, downtown. But that, look, let me look into it. I don't. That's a, it's a great question. Perfect. All right, and we'll put that on our radar as well. Going back, people very excited about Harbor Place redevelopment now that there are residents surrounding it because there were not as many, of course, 40, 50 years ago. Can the city make sure that codes for noise construction work are enforced? We are still having to deal with trash pickups at 4 to 5 a.m. Councilman Costello? Right, that's what I was going to ask. <laughs> so the, I, I believe the building that, that Sue is referring to um, has mixed collection for trash, specifically both DPW and private collection. Um, we are happy to uh, remind, you know, our, our Department of Public Works, uh, as well as our private sector partners that assist uh, with trash collection there, of the need to follow city code, which is that should not be occurring. 
uh, at four or five in the morning. So Sue, if you want to follow up with me over email, um, I, I know you've brought a number of, of issues to my attention in the past and, and happy to, I, I think we can help out with this one in short order. Perfect, thank you. Last question that we have here and we'll transition um, comes from Ed Guns. He's asking about whether or not there's any money for the Compass Project at um, Howard and Lexington. I do wanna let everybody know we did put in the link a list to your to the letter of really all of the wonderful things that you, you all have been able to spend money on. Yeah, you know, I think I'm not, I'm not positive about the Compass Project in particular. Um, the, what, so I'd have to get back to you on, on the specific project. What I will say is we put significant amounts of money into the Department of Housing and Community Development to the tune of about $650 million. Um, that is money that can go for things like Project Core, Project Restore, uh, things uh, like the, our um, uh, community block grant initiatives that, we, that are the lifeblood of community redevelopment. And so the specific things that I mentioned were kind of direct investments in the capital budget, but throughout our state agencies, but particularly in the Department of, of Housing and Community Development, there are significant, significant, significant resources that can be allocated towards projects to help close financing gaps, to help kind of move them to fruition, to kind of help with beautification, to demolish, to restore. So um, I'm not, I don't know if the capital budget has a specific one for that one, but I do know that there are gonna be incredible resources and look, to his credit, Secretary Holt has been very focused on this and has been very helpful. Um, that's the Secretary of the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, he understands uh, the investments that are needed and the public investments that, that help stimulate private investment. And so you know, he's been a great partner in the work and, and we really need to maximize that for the next, you know, uh, I guess it's eight months of the administration. I think he's ready to, to find projects like Compass to, to help and um, you know, we stand ready to help facilitate it. Thank you, and, and thank you for the shout out for Secretary Holt. He's been Holt. He's been an amazing partner, um, crime and safety infrastructure, just all of it for our facade improvement. And so, shout out to them, Councilman Costello. I'm gonna come back to you to do a closeout first. Uh, Secretary Ken Holt is the best thing since sliced bread and air conditioning. Uh, he is phenomenal. He has really been a great partner in the city. Um, Senate President Ferguson, uh, my state senator in the 46th district cannot thank you enough for your leadership, for your partnership, for everything that you're doing every single day in Annapolis uh, for our city and to help us move forward. Thank you, Senator, appreciate you. Thank you, likewise, back at you. Thank you, Shalanda, thank you, Downtown Partnership. And actually thanks as well to everybody that's been on the call. And it looks like there's got you know over 50 people have stayed on throughout this. Look, we need every single person. This is a team effort and um, we have unbelievable opportunity ahead. Uh, we just have to, we have to tap into it, organize it, and move on it. And so um, it's going to take every single person. Just want to thank everyone that's 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 been passionate enough to tune in and uh, appreciate it. We're, we're going to do some great things moving forward. No, which is great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, do want to remind everybody. So yes, we have the people who tuned in. We also get a lot of our views. This will live on our website. So we want to make sure that people have an opportunity not only look at it, but share it. We want to make sure that this message goes far and wide. Thank you, Senate President Ferguson. As I said in my opening, I mean, you have been amazing, not just about downtown, not just about our city, but for the state. And so we're lucky to have you, my Senator as well, Councilman Castell. You can't just cloak, can't, can't uh, keep him for yourself. So thank you. And thank you, Councilman, for being a great partner. So for everybody on here to sign up for the latest news about everything that's happening downtown, please follow us on our social pages at Downtown Baltimore on both Instagram and Facebook and Downtown Balt on Twitter. You can always visit our website, go downtownbaltimore.com. Thank you so much and have a good one.